Um, I would say that uh, I really think that this man really needs no introduction. I mean, I could read out the back jacket biography that they have of him here. I think that you're all here because you're tremendous fans, as am I. Um, he, of course, is the author of The Swimming Pool Library, The Folding Star, The Spell, The Line of Beauty, which won the 2004 Man Booker Prize. Um, now I am reading at the back cover, oh well. He's the finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. He has received the Somerset uh, Maugham Award, the E.M. Forster Award, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the James Tate Black Memorial Prize for Fiction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great uh, honor um, to invite Alan to come up to do a reading for us. Followed by that, we'll do a quick interview and we'll be taking questions from the audience as well. Uh, Alan Hollinghurst. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seamus. Um, I'm going to read a few pages from the first section of this novel, which has five of them. Um, it's spread over the best part of a century, um, but it's in five episodes, which have often long gaps in between them. Um, the first section is called Two Acres, which is the name of a house in Stanmore, in the northernmost edges of London, then still a village um, in 1913 when this takes place, and now engulfed in the greater London sprawl. Um, then it was still a place where you could go to work on the train in the city of London and come home in the evening to a house with woods and fields at the end of the garden. Um, it's the home of a widow, a youngish widow called Frida Saul, and her three children, Hubert the eldest, who's now precisely going into London on the train every day, George, the middle son, who's 18 um, and in his second year at Cambridge University, and their younger sister, Daphne, who's 16. Um, and the first section of the book really just describes one weekend when George, who's never really had a, a friend before, um, invites um, a rather awe-inspiring friend from Cambridge, slightly older than himself, called Cecil Valance, um, to come and stay. Um, the souls are all put into a bit of a flutter by his imminent arrival. Um, Cecil comes from a minor aristocratic family, um, and he's making a name for himself as a poet. And a, a lot of the poems that he's, he's written seem to have been about his own house, uh, which is called Corley Court in Berkshire. Um, on the first night of his visit, um, Cecil persuades young Daphne to have her first irresistible but revolting um, puff on a cigar. Um, on the second night, he reads to the assembled, uh, variously drunk and bemused guests after dinner from his own poems, um, and also from Tennyson's In Memoriam, from which the title of this novel comes. Uh, young Daphne, who's utterly innocent of anything to do with uh, love and sex, um, is very impressed by the, the presence of this glamorous, dynamic young man in the, in the house. Um, what nobody else in the household knows um, is that George and Cecil are having a passionate affair. And on the Sunday afternoon, we've followed them into the woods where they make love in a scene which, with uncharacteristic restraint, I don't actually describe. Uh, uh, <coughs> But whilst they're at it, um, George suddenly sees his, what he thinks is his sister's hat moving along in the, the near distance. Um, and they're, they're rather panicked that Daphne might have seen them at it. Um, not, George thinks, because she'd have the faintest idea what they were doing, um, but because she might tell their mother about it, who would have a probably rather better idea. Um, so after dinner on the Sunday, Cecil wants to find out whether she has indeed said anything. Um, and springs rather a surprise on her. When supper was over, George was sent round to the Cosgroves on some mission he clearly thought beneath him. Hubert claimed he had letters to write, and their mother, trailing into the drawing room, paused, raised a finger, and went out again. Cecil and Daphne were left for a minute on the hearth rug. Daphne saw this as the threshold to the grown-up end of the evening, 
with social requirements she wasn't quite sure of. I don't suppose you want to hear the gramophone, she said. She had a sense of opportunity, made more incoherent by her fear of boring Cecil. Not specially, he said, casually but kindly, with a smile she hadn't seen before, a candid gape that slightly startled her and was probably a Cambridge thing. It was hard to work out, but at Cambridge, it seemed, it was almost a sign of respect to be disrespectful, to say just what you felt at any time. Cecil was fingering in his waistcoat pocket, then brought out his little clipper. He said, I wonder if Miss Saul would care to keep me company while I enjoy my cigar. Oh, yes, said Daphne. Oh, I'll get a coat. And she ran to the cloakroom under the stairs. It was such an exciting idea that there were bound to be strenuous arguments against it. But that was part of Cecil's atmosphere and appeal. She came back not with her own dull coat, but with one of George's old tweed jackets round her shoulders. She liked the air of improvisation. A man's jacket seemed to show she was up for a lark and to carry some chivalrous hint of her need for protection. It's a little bit smelly, she said, though she hardly imagined that would worry Cecil, who tends to be a bit pongy. Uh, well, I'm going to make a smell too. Well, quite. I may be being too sensitive, said Cecil, glancing towards the door. My mother's so down on smoke at Corley Court we all sneak off to the smoking room. She's made it into quite a guilty pleasure. No, no, said Daphne. Cecil drew out a cigar case from a surprising pocket. I've got two if you're tempted to try again, he said, and uncapped the stiff leather sheath to show her the tops of them. They made her think of soldiers or the cartridges in Hubert's rifle. She saw it might be wittier not to answer, and he seemed amused by her condescending smile. She knew she should call to her mother, but sighed just to think of the objections, and followed Cecil out into the garden, leaving the French window ajar. It was quite a bit colder than last night, though she was not going to mention it. She said, Cecil, I think I shall always associate in memoriam with you. Well... Cecil was fussing with a lighted match and making impatient, appreciative noises as he drew on his cigar. Then the newly conjured smoke was all around them. Shall we sit here? Let's walk on, said Cecil, moving her along past the windows of the sitting room. We'll see what the stars are up to, shall we? All right, said Daphne, and as he crooked his arm, she reached up to slip her hand through it. As well as everything else, there was something entirely proper about Cecil. He perhaps wasn't even aware of her happy sense of play-acting, her toss of the head in the dark as she took his arm. Then George's jacket, merely slung round her shoulders, slipped off. Here, let me help you. In the gloom on the edge of the lawn, Cecil held the coat and patted her shoulders when she'd got it on. I must look like a tramp, she said, her hands covered by the sleeves, silky linings cold for a moment on bare arms, the weight and smell of the thing hugged round her. Do it up, said Cecil, his cigar between his teeth. And again, his large hands seemed to take care of her, to be larger and more capable than ever. Then he offered his arm once more. They went on a few leisurely paces, Daphne happily self-conscious, Cecil a touch reserved, though she wasn't sure of his face, and perhaps he was merely working out the stars. She knew he'd had three or four glasses of wine, Decisions would come easily to him, though to a sober person they might seem whimsical and delayed. She looked up above the silhouette of the treetops. I fear it's too cloudy tonight, Cecil, she said. Cecil huffed out another cloud of rich, sour smoke and cackled vaguely. Were you in the woods for long this afternoon, he said. This afternoon? Oh, not really. You didn't get much of a walk. Well, when I saw you, I came home, of course. She felt him press her arm more tightly against his side, and the beautiful, grown-up presence of Cecil, his height and his muscular warmth under evening dress, and even his voice, which she'd once thought so cutting and grand, slightly turned her head. It must have been someone else we saw earlier on. I said to Georgie, isn't that daft? But by the time he looked, whoever it was had gone. Well, it could have been. Did you call? You know, I wasn't sure. Lots of people do walk there. Of course, said Cecil. Anyway, you didn't see us. Daphne felt again she was missing something, but was carried along by the excitement of making conversation and squeezed his arm reassuringly. I would have said hello if I had. I thought you would. 
to be honest, it's George. He, he doesn't want me tagging along. Cecil made a low, disparaging murmur, and they turned round. You can see a bit better now, he said. There's the famous rockery. I know. She felt he was still rather mocking the rockery, and it emboldened her. Cecil, she said, when may I come to Corley? Hmm? To Corley? It was as though he'd never heard of such a place, and certainly had no memory of his earlier invitation. Then he laughed. My dear girl, whenever you like. Oh, thank you. Whenever you like, he said again, expanding into his decision in a tone which seemed oddly to undermine it. I suppose it won't be till the Christmas back now, will it, probably? This seemed as good as never to Daphne. No, I suppose. Get Georgie to bring you over. They moved on towards the dark outline of the rockery, which at night might truly have been taken for a greater and more distant outcrop. Daphne said, huskily casual, I imagine I could come by myself. Would your mother allow that? I am quite grown up, you know, said Daphne. Cecil said nothing. He pressed forward with his usual confidence. She thought she should say, there's a step there. She half yelled it as he stumbled and lurched down hard on his right leg, caught himself, but pulled her with him, and then lurched again to save her and grip her. Oh, Christ, are you all right? I'm fine, wincing where he'd trodden heavily on the edge of her foot. Now I've lost my dratted cigar. They were face to face, her heart still lively from the shock, and he put his arms round her waist and pulled her against him so that she had to turn her cheek to his cold lapel. He moved a hand up and down on her back over the warm tweed of George's jacket. Blasted steps, he said. I'm all right, said Daphne. She rather dreaded looking at her shoe when they got in, but Cecil was at a disadvantage, and she knew at once that he could never be blamed for anything. She said quietly, I can't think how those steps got there. Cecil gave a sigh of a laugh across her hair. Oh, child, child, he said, with a softness and a sadness she had never heard before, even from her mother. What are we going to do? Daphne eased herself a fraction freer. She wanted to play her part, felt the privilege of Cecil's attention. It was awfully nice being held so tightly by him, but there was something in his tone that worried her. Well, I, I suppose you're going to have to pack. Ha, said Cecil, again with a strange, despairing note, like his poetry voice. I think, shall we go back in? Yes, yes, he said. Can you keep a secret, Daph? As a rule, said Daphne. Let's keep this a secret. All right. She wasn't sure if she understood. Falling over a step wasn't much of a secret, but Cecil was clearly embarrassed by it. His hands relaxed slightly and travelled down almost to her bottom as he smiled and murmured, You know, it's been splendid getting to know you. Oh, well, she said, somehow paralysed by his hands. That's what we're all saying about you. There's never been anything like it. He bent his head and kissed her on the forehead, like sending her to bed. But then the tip of his nose moved down her cheek and he kissed her beside her mouth in his cigar breath and then, completely without expression, on her lips. There, he said. Cecil, don't be silly, she said. You've been drinking. And he tilted his face sideways and pushed his open mouth over hers and worked his tongue against her teeth in a quite idiotic and unpleasant way. <laughs> she pushed herself half free of him. She was alarmed, but kept her composure, even laughed rather sarcastically. You don't mind if I kiss you, said Cecil dreamily. I don't call that kissing, Cecil, she said. Hmm, said Cecil. What would you call kissing then, Daphne? His tone, dopey and mocking, slightly annoyed, tugging her back into his grasp like a dancer with a mere flourish of his suddenly inescapable strength. More something like this. And he started again, just darting his lips all over her face like a tormenting game, allowing her to dodge and turn her head a little, but holding her so tightly about the waist that she was quite hurt by the hard shape of the cigar case in his trouser pocket, thrusting against her stomach. She found she was giggling in quick, shallow breaths, and before she could help it, they turned into hot little sobs, and then a hushed wail of childlike surrender and failure. Hello? It was George, back from the Cosgroves, coming to look for them, surely. Childish, timid relief mixed almost at once with pride. But no, it was Hubert, in a funny voice, 
apologetic, but actually rather cross. I say, Cecil loosened his grip, sighed acceptingly, though the little snigger he gave her seemed to say he hadn't given up. He looked round over the top of the bushes to see who it was, and again she felt the special subject of her own secret with Cecil. They both had to be careful. She'd been frightened by him, but she still had a sense that he would know what to do. We're over here, she said, her voice clotted with crying. Are you all right? I fell down the blasted step, said Cecil. I seem to have trodden on your sister. Hubert stood there in silhouette, conveying an indignant but undecided impression. Can you walk? He said very distinctly, as though speaking over the telephone. Of course I can walk. We're just coming in. It's really a bit dark for rambling round, Hubert said. That was the point, said Cecil. We were studying the stars. Hubert peered upwards doubtfully. It's a bit cloudy for that, he said, and turned back to the house. Thank you. I think I got the side right, didn't I? How do you take reviews? Uh, neat. <laughs> <laughs> you've, been, you've been getting some exceptionally good reviews for this book. I have had some nice ones, yes. But properly flavored with little acidulous moments. So you, uh, which is, so you read them, good. obviously. Well, I do, actually. Because, you know, I bring out a book so rarely that when one does appear, I, I feel rather interested about how it fares in the world. Did you feel any pressure coming off of the line of, of beauty and winning the booker? I don't think... I, I mean, possibly I did, but I just sort of internalized it and denied it. I think, really, I just felt it was a great encouragement to do whatever I wanted to do. And... Um, now, if ever, I was going to have you know, a captive audience who would want to read whatever it was I wrote next. Um, I think generally I'm quite good at shutting out those sort of pressures and expectations um, and just sort of going into my own space and doing my own thing. Do you notice a, a difference, just the whole, you know, the media experience and the interviews, et cetera, et cetera? Do you notice a, a marked difference between when you promoted The Line of Beauty and now? In the wake of oh, it. Yes, of course, it makes a huge difference. I mean, I hadn't quite appreciated just what the impact of the booker is sort of globally, you know, much less at, at home. And there are people all over the world. I mean, I would never do this, I don't think, but who will read a book because it, because it won the Booker Prize. Um, and in the United States, I've noticed people are... But you're thankful for the people who are, do. ...are very impressed by, by it, perhaps because they're not eligible for it. Uh, it has a sort of, it has, it has a sort of, has a sort of mystique, uh, which is rather touching. There were so many good reviews for The Stranger's Child, but one that I really enjoyed, uh, it said, The Stranger's Child uh, restores gay life and love to the vibrant center of the British novel without a hint of solemnity or righteousness only supple prose and a sodden, fun bunch of obviously gloriously gay characters. <laughs> and and this is my favorite line. This is from Cleveland, but it's good. Um, and, it, and the last line said, seldom has literary restitution proved so pleasurable. I thought it was quite nice. Very nice indeed, yes. Um, it hadn't struck me that, that almost everyone was gay until I'd finished it. And then I <laughs> I thought I was doing rather well in having a lot of straight characters. Um, actually, the, I mean, my intention in the book was that there should be a lot of sort of sexual ambivalence in it, and yeah. there's quite a lot, there are several sort of crucial bisexual characters, and I hope often the reader doesn't know just what what's going on behind closed doors or whether X actually did have it off with Y. Um, the whole uh, the book, which goes on, I mean, after I, I don't think one's giving away too much to say that. Um, in the pause between this first episode and the next, Cecil is killed on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the rest of the book is about his um, posthumous reputation and what people try to do to shape the way that he's remembered um, and various things about him which cannot be um, mentioned at all. And the, uh, the, the pre-First World War part of the book slowly emerge over the century into the... Was that something when you, when you uh, entered into... when you sat down and you wanted to write this book, was that one of the themes, the telling of history, the moulding of character over time? I was very interested, yes, in, in 
what happens when somebody, a writer particularly, dies young mm -hmm. um, because they haven't known many people um, compared with you know, the number they would have known if they died in ripe old age. So there isn't a long sort of Bod a large body of, of material sort of writing about them and remembering them in their, their lifetime. Um, the people who haven't known them, known them will tend to be other young people who may have been sort of fervently engaged with them. So there's rather a hothouse atmosphere about the death, especially of someone sort of sexually magnetic who, who dies when they're very young. Um, I mean, I, I had a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of Rupert Brooke behind yeah. this guy, although I think mean, he's very different in some ways. Uh, but Brooke obviously was someone who had, was burdened really with this um, extraordinary physical beauty, which I think really made his his private life extremely difficult and complicated. Um, but meant that after he died, um, of course not in combat but of a mosquito bite, um, he was able to be turned into this sort of icon of, oh my gosh, of, yeah. of, of the, the gilded generation of youth that had been uh, wiped out by the war. And it took a very long time for that to be and, you know, properly examined. Um, and when a memoir came to be written of Brooke um, after the war, it was very strictly... I mean, this was an idea I really pinched directly for my book. It was very strictly um, managed by Brooke's powerful, domineering mother. Um, and it was friends of Brooke's who read this memoir, sort of found it, the portrait in it, completely unrecognisable from the person that they'd known in real life. Um, Jeffrey Keynes, who was obviously in love with Brooke and be appointed himself his literary executor, brought out in the late 60s a volume of Brooke's letters, which was heavily censored and did a great deal to... I mean, it did say more um, about his affairs with women. But it was, I think, only in the 90s that letters were finally published in which Brooke described his often quite violent um, sexual escapades with other men. Um, and so I was very fascinated by the extremely slow... Sort of percolation of the truth yeah. uh, th through this sort of barrier of, of um, vested interests and um, that was certainly one of, the, one of the themes that I wanted to describe. And another one, um, in the line of beauty, it, uh, a lot of it has to do, I guess, with the coming of age of, a, of, an, of an openly gay uh, young Oxford grad in, in the heart of London during the Thatcher era at a time when, when how uh, gays were perceived was was very was changing and, and was quite tumultuous but y you stretch that out over the course of a century in this one yes i think i suppose that i mean i didn't i never want to do anything which is too sort of pro programmatic in that way and to suggest that the book is a history of something because that's actually what i mean i'm really much more interested in writing about the, the sort of intimate confusions of often rather peculiar individuals you know rather than types um but i think Yes, there's the, the gay story that cannot be mentioned in the atmosphere before the First World War. Yeah. The section set in the... The Cambridge thing. Yeah, the Cambridge thing. Uh, the section that's set in the 1920s, you feel there's been a, a sort of shift in the moral atmosphere after the war. Um, and there's that sort of brisk Bloomsbury use of words like bugger to, bugger to describe the uh, gay, gay people. Buggery means homosexuality, you know, and it's a sort of no-nonsense approach to the subject, um, which, none, <laughs> which nonetheless, you know, a lot of people find very difficult. Um, when Lytton Strachey's letters, well, it was talked about publishing Lytton Strachey's letters just after he died in the late 30s, Virginia Woolf said, you know, of course they must be published. Uh, nobody minds about buggery now. Bug buggery's exploded. And, uh, but she, she, but she, she, she soon found that actually Burgery hadn't been exploded and that people didn't mind about it very much. And, you know, they weren't published until long after. In fact, um, in 1967, which is the date of the, the middle section of the book, uh, which is a very important date in British social history, I think, because it was the passing of the, the Sexual Offences Bill, which decriminalised um, homosexual acts between two men over 21 in private. Um, and it ushered in a new period in which it was possible to say, say things about the private lives of biographical subjects, for instance, which hadn't been so easy before. Mm. And Michael Holroyd's Great Life of Lytton Strachey came out um, in the autumn of 1967, which was really the first biography to write openly and 
fully and unembarrassedly about the, the private life of a gay writer. Um, so it was, it, I, I was interested in, in, in just touching on these, these moments when larger moral perceptions seem to be changing. 